All right. Thank you so much for joining us today for Google Plus Hangout, which is brought to you by Uprising of Love and the It Gets Better Project. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, trans images and inclusion in media and sports and schools. Uh, we have an amazing panel of people today. We have um, Eli Ehrlich. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi. Um, nice to be here. I'm Eli. I'm a um, freshman at Pitzer College. I also run the organization Trans Student Equality Resources. All right, thank you so much for being here. And next we have uh, Fallon Fox and Kai Lums. Hey. Hi there, I'm, I'm Fallon Fox. I'm a professional MMA fighter. I am Kai Allens. I'm the founder of Project I'm Enough, a project dedicated to encouraging self-love. Yes, and somebody that still owes me a game of basketball, but we can get into that later. Oh my God, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always <ready>. I'm <laughs> And last but not least, we have uh, Kyler Brodus. Hey guys, I'm Kyler Broadus and I'm the Senior uh, Policy Counsel and Transgender Civil Rights Attorney with the, uh, actually, I run the Transgender Civil Rights Project with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Great, awesome. All right, thank you all for joining us. So let's just jump right into it. Um, thinking about trans people in sports and media. So for Fallon and Kai, can you talk a little bit about how coming out as trans has affected your relationship in the sports world, your relationships to other athletes, and your relationships to other sports professionals, if at all? Right. Well, for me, it's affected me um, both positively and negatively within the MMA world. So with athletes, I think um, the negative has been that some of them have been saying negative comments or um, portraying me in a negative way in order to uh, give them more notoriety right? Mm. or more views or for them to look better. It's always um, helpful in some situations if you're if to, to down someone to uplift yourself which is right. cool. <laughs> right. Right. But I think right. that's, that's what's going on a lot um, as far as the athletes are concerned. Um, the media is doing the same thing within the MMA world, some of it, not all of it. Um, they tend to want to portray me in a negative light or kind of a controversial light, you could say. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, that's our lot as trans people at the moment. We're, we're seen as controversial and that's what some of the media is doing for us. So that's how it is within MMA uh, athletes for media. What was the other? The other? So. Well, just with, you know, just athletes and just uh, sports Professionals in general, journalists or managers. Or yes, and, and, and on, on, a positive, folks. on a positive side, um, there have been some good things. I think outside of MMA and, and just average everyday media, um, mainstream media, I've been looked at as more in, in a positive light. If you could see the, the last GQ article or uh, New York Times, um, mm -hmm. I think that the conversation is changing in regards to trans people in sport and me in particular. Great. Yeah. What about you, Kai? For me, like I'm trying to think back. You know, I didn't play basketball in two years. Uh, but when, when I came out um, to athletes or coaches or anything of that sort, either they were cool with it or they weren't. <laughs> um, and uh -huh. yeah, that was that. I mean, in, in terms of media, um, you know, yes, there were a lot of people who were who were ignorant, who didn't know how to how to report um, accurately or respectfully, I should say. Uh, but there were those who did. There were those who did talk to me and say, oh, okay, Kai, how, how would you like me to write this article? And they were great about it. Um, and so for me, I, I don't think that I would see it as, uh, you know, uh, whether it was an athlete or a journalist, um, you know, how they took it. So I, th I, think, I think it's just like, as a whole, um, it has to do with, with, with whether, whether you understand what, what how to talk to a trans person or not. You know, it, it, it has, it, it's... What am I trying to say? Like your your identity or your label. Like whether you're whether you're a journalist, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a coach, that, yeah. that doesn't dictate you know how how educated you are on, on a certain situation on a, you know on being trans. Uh, and so it it's it varied. You know what I mean? Like there were people who were respectful. There were people who weren't. Um, mm -hmm. It just depended on what their experiences were with other trans people and whether or not they had already done the research and educated themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I, I'd also like to add that with me. Um, I think a, a big thing that helped, well, say, my teammates when I came out to them, uh, all of them were, 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 were pro, pro my inclusion as far as I could tell. So when they know you, when they know a lot about you, 
things are a lot different. Yeah, it's it's, it's harder for them to 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 use you as a controversial sh subject or to put you down if they know you. But that's the problem. It's easy for them to to slam a person for being trans and say that they don't belong if they don't have a connection to you. And that's something that we need to fix. We need to make a connection and humanize ourselves to other athletes and to the to the media for them to uh, feel that it's worth it to not to not to not use us in a negative way. Right. Right. You know, I read a statistic that said that uh, only 8% of people actually know a trans person, which means like the other 92% of the people are getting their ideas of what a trans person is and who we are and what we look like and how we live our lives from, from other sources. But and I want to open this up to everybody. Is, is there a shift happening in the culture around how people are relating to us as trans people? <laughs> And and does that and does that shift or will that shift trickle down to influence some type of policy changes? This is for anyone. Well, Teak, I'll I'll jump in. Mm -hmm. This is Kyler. Yes, I I think definitely we we see policy changes. Kai has been a forefront uh, at the forefront of these changes. Fallon is at the forefront of a lot of changes that are happening. These two are leaders uh, with lots of changes and these are trickling down to grade schools, if you will, where these conversations are happening and you know we see at the collegiate level obviously where Kai was instrumental but now we see you know high school associations having these conversations. We see right. junior high uh, uh, and then we see non-school, uh, you know, where it's the Pee Wee League or the whatever having these conversations. And uh, whether these two realize it or not, they have spurred lots of conversation and lots of changes and lots of policy changes that are happening. Even though there's only, as you say, 8% that claim to know, there are lots of us out there that... Um, <coughs> that they really do know us. So I think there's lots of changes that are happening. Yeah. So um, it said that trans people are where LGB people, uh, gays and lesbians were 20 years ago. Um, so has the needs of the trans community fallen through the cracks of the larger community? Has the T largely been silent? Yeah. If anyone. Go ahead, Eli. Um, well, personally, yes, I do think there is a lot of silencing of um, transgender people. We see a lot of laws that are for um, first cisgender sexual minorities, but no trans people. And this is something we're seeing less and less of, fortunately, especially with more media representation that is fair and accurate, which is really fortunate. And now we're starting to see um, some a policy that's specifically for trans people, like um, the School Success Opportunity Act out here in California, which allows trans students to participate with their own gender in school. Great. So what do you think, so what is it that we need to do so that the trans community um, is on par uh, in respect to the level of understanding and acceptance that um, the gay and lesbian community is getting now? What, what are the steps that need to be taken for the trans community? I don't want to take up a lot of space. Does anybody else have? I'll jump in. I, Please, you know, I'm ahead. a proponent of us being leaders of our own movement and embracing that, and I think that's really important. And uh, uh, and while you know it takes all of us to build a movement, I think that more of us have to step forward and lead that movement as trans people. And it's great to see Eli doing what Eli is doing and, and Kai and Fallon doing what they're doing by being out there and in the forefront. And I think that's what it takes uh, by having no fear and doing what these folks are doing. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, I, I would say that it's, it starts with us. Um, and I, I, I'm always an advocate for self-love. Um, and I think that, that we, you know, I'm speaking from my experience. You know, I, I need to learn how to love myself before I can ask anyone else to love and understand me. Um, and, right. I, and I see a lot of, of self-hate within the trans community. Um, and I think that if, if we, we took a moment to really just love ourselves, you know, and, and then took that step forward to, okay, now let's, now how are we going to go about, you know, educating the LGB community or cisgender people um, on, on how to better talk to us? Um, I think that that's, that's the first step. You know, the first step is what am I doing for myself? 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and also I think I think what's really important is um, being visible too, making sure that we have a really strong and visible presence, you know, in the community and outside of it. Fallon, were you going to say something? Yeah. I, th I think we also need to make a push um, for the LGB and cisgender community, mm -hmm. for them to understand themselves, because right now we're, we're running into a problem where uh, gender and sexuality has yeah. been has been has been crisscrossed, and, and they, a lot of people don't understand that it's, it's it's a separate issue. So I think that once cisgendered people and LGB people understand themselves, they'll stop uh, putting us uh, is, is us in that position where they believe that we're just like them or like we're crazy or something. You know what I'm saying? They need to understand what gender identity is, mm -hmm. and and I think that'll that'll go a long ways. Do you want to explain a little bit of what the difference is between sexual orientation and gender identity? Gender identity is, is, is all about gender. Sexual mm -hmm. uh, expression and sexual identity is all about sex. It's a different thing. It's about, you know, being with someone and, and sexual desires. Gender identity is who you are. Um, uh, I think Kai, Kai can explain this. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a good, very good way of explaining it. Okay. I mean, I mean, um, <laughs> we talk about, you know, gen gender stuff. To understand that, we need to understand that gender and sex are two different things. Gender is who I am and how I see myself. My sex, those are my body parts, right? And then you have sexual orientation. So me, as a trans man, how I see myself, I, I am a man. That has nothing to do with who I'm attracted to. Tomorrow, right. I might want to be with a guy. The next day, I might be with a girl. Who knows? But that's me, right? right? That's right. God. But that does right. not take away from the fact that I am a man. And why am I a man? Because I said so. I can be whoever I want to be, just like any of you. Right, right, exactly. Um, so we have a question here from Sue and Sarah. They say, do you prefer to socialize with other trans people or prefer to mix within the wider community? Can you repeat? Sorry. It said, um, from Sue and Sarah, they asked, do you prefer to socialize with other transgender people or prefer to mix within the wider community? And this is open to everyone. And, and why? That's okay. a good question. I mean, I'll go. Y'all ain't ready. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I prefer, I would... What trans people are amazing, because <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, like for me, like it's, and I'm not saying that you know trans people are better. I mean, but no, I mean like, but like to, for for me, being trans is simply defining defining who you are. But right. but those, but not everybody who defines who they are is trans. So 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 it's like I love being around people who can say, you know what, I'm not gonna listen to society. I'm going to listen to myself. I want to wear this outfit. I want to like this person, and I'm going to do this job, and that's me. You know, what's what's more amazing than, than self-definity? You know what I mean? Right. Self-determination, self right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that, that's what trans is. Yeah. How about the rest of the panel? Socializing with, preferring to socialize with trans folks or mix it up a little bit? I mean, Eli. mix it up too, but, you know. <laughs> I think, uh, go ahead, Eli, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, well, Personally, I I mean I really enjoy being around other trans people because I um, I mean I just love the community. The trans community is just so great. I love people that I can relate to, and also the larger queer community is great too. And I really love to educate people and have discussions about these issues, whether they're trans or not. Okay. What's with Kyler? Um, I like to mix it up. So I like all people. Um, and, you know, I think there's enrichment from being with trans people, and, a, of course, I get empowerment and, and uh, by doing the work I do, and I spend a lot of time with trans people and in the greater queer community, probably more time than I do with, with other people, but, but I think it's important for me to have that balance. Kyla, do you think there's a lot of resources uh, here in the States for trans folks or not? Well, uh, not to give away anything about me. <laughs> particularly my age, but um, <laughs> but um, given what I know, there are lots more resources than there have been. Could there be more? Definitely there do need to be more. You know, there are pockets of people that feel like they are not serviced, they are not heard, and uh, they're, they're not internet accessible. They might not even have a phone, and I think we need to be cognizant of that in society where people have lots of privileges. You know, us doing this Google group is a privilege, and right. I think we need to be aware of that. So. Right, right. Um, so switching gears a little bit, let's, let's talk about the media. Uh, you know, we've seen some fairly misguided representation of trans folks in the media. You know, we had the Carmen Carrera and uh, Laverne Cox on Katie Couric show with the whole 
questions about the private parts. And we had this whole thing with um, the tragic incident with uh, Dr. Venville, who took her own life, um, you know, during the process of this, of that article, the Grantland article being written. Um, so what role does the media play in the perception of trans people? Well, I think, I think the media plays a, a humongous role. That's how people learn, the, the general public learns about trans people. So mm -hmm. if they, if the media portrays us as being freaks, mm -hmm. or some, or people who you can ask anything to, or ridiculous things like, oh, what, what is the status of your genitals? Right. You know, right. people, every, everyday people walking down the street are going to do the same thing and, and treat us with that much disrespect and that much misunderstanding. So I think it begins with the media. The media is how people learn about just about everything nowadays. Yeah. Fortunately, I think it's changing be, a little bit because we have the internet and at the Flick of your wrist, you can you can find out anything, just about anything. But people are lazy nowadays, so yeah, we need to work all angles uh, of media, internet, mm. uh, mm -hmm. books, media, TV. Yeah, which I mean, which which again, I I think it makes it uh, more imperative that that we create our own media um, and, and and that we are visible. Uh, I think. Organizations like you know Black Trans Media um, or <coughs> work that um, I've seen that uh, Courtney Courtney Ziegler did his Black uh, what's it called Still Black Still Black, um, yeah, still black. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know, those those are you know, great resources to, to go and check out you know what it's really like to be you know a little Black trans person but just you know trans people in general mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. We definitely need to have some ownership over our own images, and but it's also about being able to really pinpoint um, what exactly the media, what kind of stereotypes the media is perpetuating about us. And mm -hmm. I think that it's it gets complicated. And and I was saying this the other day uh, uh, when I did the CNN appearance about about Dr. Vanderbilt is that, you know, we have we have trans people like us who are very out and mm -hmm. uh, out and to talk about these things, right? Uh, so and then there's then there's trans people that are reported on in the media that are that are victims of violence, and it's how they report to that. But now we're talking about a whole other aspect of our trans identity, where we have thousands and thousands of transgender people whose being trans is just a part of their lived experience. It is isn't the focal point of of their lives. Right, and they want to live in relative anonymity, like like anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so it's that how does how is the media supposed to respond, you know, to these things? And it's it gets complicated. And I think it's complicated for us too. I think sometimes even in a community, we can get a lot of pushback on, you know, how we are presenting ourselves as trans, and if it's okay to be non-disclosure or a low disclosure, or if not. So I think that there's a lot of issues. Um, you know, when it comes to visibility, when it comes to self-determination, that have to be kind of, uh, you know, hashed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would, I mean, I would never, I would never encourage anyone to 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 speak out or be visible if they didn't feel comfortable. You know, every everything is all about you. If you don't, if you do not want to say something or share something, do not share it. Uh, so everyone, of course, everyone's not not like me. Of course, I don't mind. I'll speak whatever. You know, but if you're not that way, it's okay. That is fine. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you any less of a person. But for those who do. Um, who are okay with it and who, and who don't mind speaking up and saying, you know, this is my story, I don't mind sharing pieces of this, then share that. Because that that ultimately, in the end, will educate people on what it's like for you to be trans. Because not everybody, not 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 everybody, you know, not every trans person lives the same life. Not every trans person likes the same things. Not every trans person wants to be called the same thing, you know. It's right. Into, not every trans person out. is is an advocate, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, exactly, you know, everybody has to do the work, but everybody doesn't have to do yeah. it. Yeah, and, and I think that, that's, 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 that's the one thing that we need to realize is that we can't, you, you're not going to get all the answers from Kai, you're not going to get all the answers from Teak. You, right. yes, you have to do the work, and you have to have a conversation and ask people, oh, okay, a new person, oh my god, all right, what's your name, what, you know, yes, we have to do that. Ask the right. conversation, right. And ask questions. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also want to bring up the issue of there's the issue of safety. Some people don't, you know, you don't disclose for the issue of safety. You know, there are pockets in this world where it's just not safe to disclose, you That's know. Right. And, you know, before I came on in this role, I represented people that were just not safe. It's not safe in the workplace, and it's still not safe in the workplace for many people. It's not safe on the street for many people to disclose. So we can't judge people that don't disclose. But for those of us that are able, and as Kai says, and uh, that choose to disclose, that's great that we're able, and we're not judging people that aren't able to. But it's helpful in the movement that as we move along. And I, and I just want to speak to the point of that I've been around long enough to where I remember newspaper articles where we only put 
the person's race when we identified people mm -hmm. in, in a news article, and that was so important. And I think we're going to get to the edge where it's not important where we identify people because we have educated society about trans people enough. But we're at this curve where we still need to educate people about trans people. And I remember when I came out and it was so important. It was irritating in some ways to, to have media follow me around because I am considered, you know, it was like transsexual births at 10, you know, or details at 11. And that was actually ridiculous, um, you know. But when I came out, that was how exciting it was. Wow. Um, because they were just desperate for news. But then also back to the point that Fallon had made and the point that, that the women handled and Laverne on Katie Couric is that every interview that I did, because I did a lot of politics at the time, would be I would be totally blindsided at the end of the interview, but I was then always prepared by the end of the interview at, at a certain point to know the question was going to be always about my genitalia, uh, right. which then... It's like, and I got prepared for that to ask the reporter to say, oh, so do people ask you about your genitalia when they interview about X, Y, or Z? So that we do have to educate people of what is or isn't appropriate questions or are, aren't appropriate questions to ask us uh, and do that education. And then back to Kai's point, we do have to also, and your point too, Teak, mm -hmm. have to have our own media and spend our own stories as well to help shape that media. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so is that is that what uh, the trans community needs? That a, a broader discussion about race. I think people are starting to. I feel like that there's a that there's a change that there's a shift that people are starting to. We've already started to look at sexuality as a spectrum, um, and slowly I, I think that maybe we're starting to look at gender um, as a spectrum. And if you, Eli, you've been kind of quiet. What do you think about that? Do you think that that conversations around gender? Uh, spectrum is is what we need or yes definitely um, I mean what we know now in the trans community is that um, but gender gender isn't a binary we there aren't just men and women there are other genders there are people who are assigned one gender at birth and they're not, then they identify as another gender at some point in their life mm -hmm. and I believe this um, progress of knowledge will continue as the public gains like valuable knowledge about the trans community and I really hope that this will help other trans youth be able to grow up as their authentic selves and not be forced into the boxes of their sex assigned at birth. Right, right. Thank you for that. Um, and Eli, let me ask you another question. Uh, what are what immediate resources, uh, you know, in, in, in your opinion, are lacking for trans people, particularly trans youth? Um, wow. Well, there's there's honestly quite a lot. As we were talking about before, in the um, in the cisgender community and the cisgender queer community, there are plenty of resources. There are centers. Um, there's policies, and we're missing a lot of those things. And we are a bit behind mm -hmm. um, because people aren't just accepting, and we're a smaller group. Um, when I mean, I came out ten years ago when I was eight years old. There are no resources, and it's really great to see the progress that we're making. And if we continue to make this progress, we will be caught up, and we will have the same opportunities as um, as other cisgender queer people. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So you know, um, when Laverne was on, when Laverne Carmel on Katie Couric, Laverne referred to herself as a uh, a possibility model, which I thought was really great. Um, and, you know, and being that we're all here, we're out. We we probably serve as a possibility model for a lot of people. But who has been that model for you in your life? And this is open to all of you. Personally, for me, it's been um, Parker Marie Malloy, who's this really excellent writer and trans advocate. Mm. She is totally, she is totally amazing. I I have a lot of respect for her and being able to um, to publicly speak about personal experiences and also political things. And a lot of re the respect also comes for her um, speaking out against inappropriate language used by some media sources that she even writes for. And that's, I have a lot of respect for that. Awesome. Anybody else? Who's your possibility model? My possibility models, I would say, would be every transgender per person on the face of the planet who has a job or an occupation mm. that's considered outside of the norm for a transgender person. Right. Everyone. Right. I, remember, I remember 
back when I first began transition, I looked at the website uh, TS Women's Success, I believe it was, mm -hmm. and there were just a lot of different occupations held by trans women, and that 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 inspired me. There was a a cyclist, there was lawyers, there was different types of people doing different types of things in our society just like everyone else. Those are my possibility models. It's possible yeah. to be anything that you want to be. Yeah. Even an MMA, MMA fighter for that matter. Yeah, and that's so important because I think a lot of people think that trans people, we, that we exist in some kind of little bubble, but you know, trans people are in all walks of life. I know a trans guy that, that drives an 18 wheeler, you know, I know an artist, I, you know, I know, you know, lawyers and doctors, like we're, you know, we're in, we're in there, we're in, integrated into, into society. I think that's really important for people to, to know that we're not, you know, we don't exist in like, you know, fantasy camp or something like we're here. You know, we're in your families, we're in your classrooms, we're in your, you know, in your offices, you know, all these things. What about you, Kai? Um, I would say, well, first of all, you know, I love Laverne, love Carmen. Uh, two amazing women do amazing, doing amazing things. Um, my possibility models, I mean, you talk about possibilities, and so that, that, that changes every single day, right? Like, every time I wake up, I meet somebody, and when I see, you know, all these amazing kids that I get to speak to, they inspire me to do so many amazing things, and they, they, they teach me things that I, I didn't think that I could do. Uh, when right. I see when I see someone walking down the street, when I see a man walking down the street looking fabulous, having all heels, you know, a dress, you know, doing things like that, making that gives me the confidence, you know, say, you know what, maybe I can do that. Why can't I do that? You know. Um, right. So my my possibility models change every day, and right now my possibility models is Fallon Fox, is Teak Blonde, <laughs> I mean, it's Eli, it's Kylar, you know, it's, it's all y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Kylar, what about you? Well, you know. I, I don't want to be cliche, but I'm following Fallon and Kai, and, and I have to agree. You know, my possibility models uh, change every single day because uh, when I go out and speak, um, which which really is what it's about to me, it's about uh, making a way so people didn't have to experience what I had to experience. Yeah. So when I go out and see that and see the four or five year old kid, the parents really got it and provide it for the kid, that's my possibility model. And it just brings tears to my eyes. So uh, I have to agree with Kai and Fallon. Mine change every day in that way as well. Um, when I first uh, got into the experience as far as being trans, there were actually no possibility models for me out there. And I do think that's important uh, to have those possibility models uh, for folks uh, so you know, you know it's possible. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question here from Sage Fox, and the question is, what do you consider uh, the biggest challenges, the biggest challenge facing us today in the fight for transgender equality? There's one biggest challenge. I know for me, I think it's, I think it's public perception. It's just how, how people perceive trans people. I think, I think that there's a lot of misconception out there exactly of who we are, and I think that that, that can lead itself to uh, violence and discrimination and people thinking that, particularly with trans women that, you know, particularly trans women of color, are, you know, are just, are not a whole human being, but are just the sum of their parts right. over sexualization and things like that. I think public perception is a huge issue. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree to you. I mean, it's definitely uh, public perception. Uh, because if, if public's perception was, well, you know, if everyone understood what it meant to be trans, what, what would we be fighting for? You know, every, everyone would get it, and you know what I mean? So I feel, I feel like that, that definitely is the, the biggest thing, um, is the public perception. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have to jump in and agree also, and it's not even just trans women that they over-sexualize. I mean, it's even, it's all trans people. It's yeah. just that unfortunately trans women are put out there more uh, but they over sexualize all trans people and that's all they relegate or think when they think trans uh, and if everybody understood we would have no I wouldn't have a job <laughs> it, right. you know, I wouldn't have a job we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation right uh, because we wouldn't have to pass legislation to protect people because people would just get it and we wouldn't have to worry about people being attacked. So, right. I think you know, public perception is is key. I think the biggest hurdle is getting these corporations and businesses and media to to under, to, to feel that it's, it's it's profitable to portray trans people in a positive light. Because right now, I don't think that they believe it's possible. It's, it's profitable 
Yeah. They show us po positively. And so that's yeah. why they're always showing us negatively. So we need to, like, let them know that it's profitable to show us in a positive light. That's a good point. Yeah. And, you know, and I think the reason why uh, oftentimes trans women kind of bear the brunt of, uh, you know, the abuses and of the stereotypes is, is a broader conversation just about around gender and around women. You know, we're talking about this intersection of not just transphobia and sexism that exists for women, for non-trans women and trans women. And then, you know, that coupled with, you know, the fetishizing and the objectifying of transness, you know, makes it, makes it really hard, you know, for the trans girls. So I think that, I think for, for trans men, just being a man gives you a place of privilege, and it's important for us to be able to deconstruct that privilege so that we don't start to recreate it in, in our world as transgender people or as people that are on the binary. You know, we don't understand not all trans people exist on the binary, but for those of us that do, being able to really deconstruct these kind of modes of socializing with each other, you know, to create something new, to create a new structure. And, and and I can agree with some of that, but I want to give you some pushback. And I know mm -hmm. Eli hasn't spoken on this. There is some privilege, but however, there is not always privilege for people that transition. Uh, you know, there is lack of privilege actually for some that transition from female to male, and that mm -hmm. happens because there is resistance or reluctance into the boys' club that comes with that. And then mm -hmm. for men of color, there are issues that occur that don't occur for non-men of color. So right. yeah, while some privileges are accrued, there are lack of privileges that are not accrued for men of color. And right. then also there are there are other things that I could hash out that really uh, that trans men don't get. Uh, we can go and we can hash out healthcare, for instance, and I mean we can break it down. And and, right. and so I don't like to compare. That's why it's difficult to compare oppressions to oppressions. And I think mm -hmm. we sort of need to be careful about that in the trans community because we tend to do that. And I think if we really broke it down on paper, paper we'd be surprised about how many trans men do do sex work. And I don't think we oh, yeah. jump into that. Yeah as much and we've looked at that or how many trans men do suffer unemployment and are discriminated in the workplace because of their body parts or by other people or you know there are all these things that we haven't even looked at or had a dialogue about because what I'm finding is there are all these assumptions that are made because trans men and trans women haven't had dialogue and again we're assuming, you know we're talking in the binary yeah, and right. then, uh, but and and outside the binary as well, people make these assumptions about people living in the binary about all these privileges. So I think we we make a lot of assumption about privileges that truly don't necessarily exist uh, always in these situations. So I think we really need to be careful and really look at and deconstruct these. And I think there obviously needs to be more writing, and there that's why there is a limiting of resources. And I I know I need to. Yeah not hog up all this space, but I just really wanted to give some pushback to that that commentary. Yeah, but and, and I appreciate that, and, and and I have another question to ask. So being that there, there isn't a lot um, of observation of trans men, like you said, there are lots of trans guys that are involved in sex work and that have to deal with, you know, X, Y, and Z, but why is it that that hasn't that hasn't had much of a conversation. Why isn't? Why are we having that conversation as well as, you know, we talk about trans women and, and, and sex work and all of these things, and I think a lot of times people think trans, they think trans women. Why is it that there isn't that equal kind of footing in that regard? Not putting pushback between us and the community, but it's just people from the outside of the community looking in. What is what is that about in your opinion? You know, I don't know that I can answer that fully, but I do think okay. that trans women have been fetishized more just mm -hmm. generally and sadly and poorly because of just our just the way we have looked and you did point that out by about women and then that that uh, that gets them in that situation but then we can go to the other side is why are trans women surgeries less expensive than trans men surgeries right. you know we can go to that and it's like right. well because science has spent more money on men in general to do studies and therefore, you know, and we can say, oh, well, yeah, it's easier to take something off and put something on. But really, there's been more money spent on doing studies in that area than there have been on the other side. I mean, right. so you can right. go and you can delve in and you can do a deeper dive 
to all these questions. Right. And so I think we need to be, that's why I say we need to be careful yeah. about comparing oppressions uh, and making these statements uh, without diving in and looking further. Right. Because that's what the, go ahead, go ahead, Eli, go ahead. Oh, um, well, my question is, um, Earlier, I'm assuming you were referencing um, when you were talking about men that um, a lot of trans men fail to recognize like that they have male privilege and that they do mm -hmm. have the privilege of being that. And I also want to comment that most of the visibility around trans women is um, unfortunately brought on us because we are a lot more visible in the sex work community because more often we are the ones that are forced into it. Right. Um, and forced into um, all these awful p um, positions. The blunt of transphobia and cis sexism is directed towards trans women, and so that's why most of the conversation is um, is around us. Right. Excellent, right. Eli. And we can hide, you know, on that edge, but that's one of the edges we can hide on. But, you know, sometimes we can. I've heard horror stories of trans men being forced into sex work because they've been outed and they can't hide. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody knows that they're not, uh, you know, of, of their history, etc. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that you know, so that's why I caution us when we make these statements that we need to be very cautious about comparing oppressions to oppression. I mean, I'm totally down, and I totally, you'll see the work that I do, and I spend a lot of time, because it is, we need to spend a lot of energy preventing and protecting the trans sisters that are in this position, but we also need to be careful about um, there. There's lots of other work to do as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that, and I think that this whole this conversation we're having right now really lends itself to the idea that you know there's a lot of conversations that we need to have internally within the trans community, talking about how kind of this these. These ma this matrix of oppression that exists for everybody. We talk about like sexism and misogyny and how that can trickle down into our community and how that works. But it can, but, but Kyla, you're right. It can get very sticky because you don't want to get into this place where you're where you want to compare oppressions. It's it, you know if you want to kind of get to a place where you can kind of just deconstruct how these things trickle into our, our, our psychologically. You know. Right, and you threw in race, and you asked that question of race earlier, and then you ask, and then you put gender in that place, Teak, and you had to throw in race in there also. You yeah, know, absolutely. race plays a major role uh, in all of this as well as we deconstruct all of this as as well. You know, yeah. and race is huge, and it's not talked about, and it's been part of this whole uh, equation, and mm -hmm. it's still not very talked about um, as we do this work. Right, very true, very true. Um, uh, Kai, uh, Alan, you, 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 you all said it all. That was great. Okay, okay. So, okay, so moving on. So, you know, I'm sure we're all aware of all of the um, anti-LGBT propaganda that is happening in Russia and the reaction to it around the world. So, as leaders in the trans community. If you had an opportunity to speak to uh, a young LGBT youth or a trans youth specifically in Russia who's feeling unsafe or isolated, what what is it? What could you say to that kid? Wow. I would I would tell that 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 young kid not to lose hope. Mm -hmm. That there's people working outside of their country to fix this problem, mm -hmm. and that change never 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 occurred without a struggle. So right. unfortunately, we can't do it. We can't do it all from from outside. Right. They're going to have to 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 do it themselves. They we can support them and do as much as we can, but they're going to have to. There's going to have to be some fighters there, some hard hitters, some people who aren't going to be scared of of, of what's going to happen to them. It's just going to have. There's going to have to be some sacrifice. And they're fighting yeah. a government that that really isn't giving them this freedom of speech. Yeah, that and, I think is a really good point. And, and is allowing them to 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 be harmed and. This, that's something that they're going to have to like work from the inside, but but just to know that there's people on the outside that are going to help them, like like me and Kai and just just mm -hmm. advocacy groups as much as we can, and we're fighting for them not to lose hope. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, I what would I say to them? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I I would I mean it right right away. I'd be I'd probably be like, all right, where are you? I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> But realistically, on a more serious note, what would I say? Um, I would say that I don't, I don't know you, but I, I love you. You know, I love you. I love you. There, there. I'm here. 
um, to support you. If you need me, go to my website. You know, we can have a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm here. You know, I, I, I yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I would say. Eli, what about you? Um, I just say stand up and speak out. This needs to be something that's fixed inside of Russia and by Russians, not Americans. Mm -hmm. um, because we're outside the country, we can't really do that much. Right. And also, in a lot of ways, this is um, the dialogue around Russia has been a bit of a problem <laughs> in the sense that we've begun to ignore problems within our own country. And that we do face a lot of silencing. Just last year, a bill almost passed in Arizona that wouldn't allow trans people into stores and um, would allow them to be arrested. This, is, this isn't just a Russian problem. This is American. This is an international issue. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Right. Tyler? Wow. Um, as tears come to my eyes uh, when you asked the question and listening to the answers, yeah, I do agree, you know, uh, they have to fix internally, but, you know, I'm like, God, I want to go there. I want to, like, swoop up everybody in my little spaceship and, like, suck <laughs> everybody out. <laughs> take everybody away. But since I really don't have one for those listening outside, um, mm. um, you know, uh, I, you know I, I think of, you know, keep hope alive. You know, I think if you keep hope alive, and Fallon said that earlier, and I'm ripping that off Fallon because it was so good, but I mean, it really is. I just think you have to keep hope alive. I think change does happen, and change can happen so quickly, and, and I do think that we do have a different perspective in the world today than we did a few years ago, that it's a global world. Uh, uh, and not that it hasn't been before, but there's lots of pressure from the outside to do the right thing on the inside. Right, right, great. All right, well, you know, I want to thank you all so much for being here. And I think in closing, I think, you know, we could all agree that, you know, when we're, if we could send a message out to, you know, young kids in Russia, young, you know, LGBT kids in Russia, in Nigeria, in Cameroon, you know, we're going to tell them all that it definitely gets better and that they are loved. And I really appreciate you all being here and being leaders in the community, being thought leaders and uh, being visible to tell your story. Um, you know, and everybody continue to do the work and uh, change the world. So thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Google Plus and the uh, Uprising of Love. Um, this has been really good. Thank you, T. Thank You've you been amazing. Thanks for having us on. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Thank you.